Hi, I'm Rick Anthony, and welcome to the Someone You Should Know podcast, the podcast that focuses on musicians, authors, and interesting people. We like to say we're making a difference one artist at a time. So sit back, have a cold one, and get ready to meet someone you should know. I have a real treat on Someone You Should Know today, an old friend and radio brother of mine who actually helped me train when I started at K-Hits 96 back in 1996. Very talented radio personality. He and his wife have a great show that's all about travel. Will you please welcome my dear friend, guy with the greatest set of pipes in radio, my brother, Kevin McCarthy. Well, hello there. Great to hear your voice again. And I think you qualified that by saying old friend. Old friend, yeah, absolutely. Def- yeah, I'm definitely getting old. <laughs> you, you, hey, you and I both on Social Security. We'll take it, buddy. <laughs> you bet. We earned it. <laughs> this this is one of those episodes I think I could probably talk for a couple of hours. So let's get to the, to the meat and potatoes right off the, the bat, Kevin. Why did you get into radio? What was your why? Well... Going back to, I think I was eight or nine years old, uh, my mother and I were waiting for my father to get off of work. We were going to have dinner at the Stratford Hotel in Alton, Illinois, mm-hmm. exactly. just across the river from St. Louis. And on the mezzanine level was the studios of WOKZ. So we were staring through the windows, and the DJ, I believe it was Jim Brown, waved us in and said, what have you been doing? And I said, well, I just got my polio shot. It hurt a little bit, but it's a heck of a lot better than getting polio. So that was my first episode on the radio, and I think I got the plug. And in fact, our travel show is still on that station now in Alton, although it's now WBGZ. I actually got into the radio itself when I was working with Household Finance, now HSBC Bank. I was in their executive management program, and in Waterloo, Iowa, there was a little station outside of the University of Northern Iowa, which was just a barn burner. I mean, it was WLS at 500 watts, <laughs> and uh, they got a new owner, and we were sitting in the bar one night, my barber, who had a shop across from mine in the big shopping center there, we heard the DJs talking about the new owner and how much they were didn't like him, and they were going to form a union. And I said, well, you know, boy, they'll be out of a job, and I should go do that. And my that man put $5 on the table and said, betcha. Mm-hmm. So Monday morning, I drove out to the radio station, talked to the new owner, and he said, well, have you ever done this before? I said, no. Uh, have you gone to school for it? No. What makes you think you can do it? I said, well, everybody thinks I've got a good voice. I used to play in a band. I know my music. I've got a killer stereo. Knobs and dials don't scare me. So he motioned me. He says, all right, come on in here. We went into the control room, and he said, that turns it on. That turns it off. That turns it up. That turns it down. Go nuts. (laughs) And and that's how I started in radio. And as, as I would transfer around with HFC, to Springfield, Illinois. I worked at two different stations there on the weekends. Uh, a good weekend is hard to find. Absolutely. Uh, one, yeah. that, one that shows up, and two is reasonably sober. <laughs> Very true. Very true. <laughs> I mean, it's true. And uh, so I worked at uh, WMAY and WCVS in Springfield. I got transferred to the St. Louis area, and the uh, general manager, program director in Springfield said, I know a guy who owns a station in the St. Louis area, and that was KIRL, Curl Radio Uh in St. Charles. And I moved into town on Wednesday, and I was on the air Saturday. I love that. (laughs) Yeah, it was great. You know, I'm still playing at my hobby. And from there, I worked at, uh, let's see, KADI, KSLQ, Mm -hmm. KS94, and actually, my first full-time job in radio was KMOX. I'll be darned. What a great station. 50,000 watt, uh, 1120 right there on the AM dial. Yeah, and I turned them down when they first uh, approached me. <laughs> oh, God. Which, yeah, anybody that's in radio knows, you know, you spend your lifetime trying to get to a KMOX or WABC or, you know. LS WLS. or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. exactly. And I had got a call on... Thanksgiving afternoon, Eve, and it was Tim Dorsey. I know, who, I know, I know Dorsey. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, yeah, he. I ended up when he bought uh, KTRS working there as well. 
But he was then the general manager at the FM side of KMOX. And he said, we'd like you to come to work for us. And uh, he said, oh, Saturday, Friday, Sunday, what? Now full time. And I said, well, you know, <clears throat> who is this, Tim? Yeah, I, I know Bob Hyland makes all the decisions there. So if this is a joke, why, okay, great, you got me. But, you know, uh, he said, well, that's fine. I understand. Give me five minutes and you call into KMOX and ask for Bob Hyland's office. And... I did, and Bob Hyland here. I went, <laughs> oh, hi, Mr. Hyland. <laughs> Do you really want to hire me? <laughs> and uh, I went down to see him. So at that time, I, I said I was in executive management. I had a company car, uh, making pretty good money, and I was about a year away from being fully vested in retirement. He made me an offer for an evening shift at basically the same salary. And I would have had to go on out and bought a car. So I turned him down oh, and wow. went home and kicked myself in the backside and decided I would not get caught with my pants down again and bought a car, an old beater. And about a month and a half later, they called me back and said, okay, we'll give you a day shift, uh, almost doubled the salary. And I went in and said, you know, I know that air talent is judged by the size of their U-Haul. And if, if this is an, if this is another you know year and a half deal, I'm still not interested. I'm leaving a career for what I hope to be another career. He stood up and shook my hand, and I spent 15 years there and never had a contract. Wonderful, <laughs> I love that. Now, Kev, you and I worked together at K Hits '96. Where'd you go after K Hits? I went to work for the city of Brentwood, Missouri, and built their uh, government cable TV channel. Oh, so and worked and back into part timing at KTRS mm -hmm. as the talk show host. Yeah, awesome, very good. I I loved working with you because you trained me, and I don't know if you remember that I came in on a Sunday and you trained me. I think you were working maybe uh, uh, ten to two or something like that, and I took over from yeah. two to six and. It was my very first time, and I'm going, good Lord, how am I going to follow a guy with pipes like these? My goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Mr. McCarthy, yeah, can you tell me how to do this? Everybody asked me if I you know, <laughs> took voice lessons at some point in my life. I said, no, cigarettes, whiskey, and wild women, and I've, <laughs> I've quit smoking. I'm trying to quit drinking as much, and I only got room for one wild woman in my life anymore so. <laughs> very good very good you know in, in my case here I was, i'm still waiting for puberty to hit so <laughs> that, yeah we never grow up in radio that's that's the first prerequisite you cannot grow up if you're on air talent in radio now, kevin you say you worked for voa a voice of america and the reason why i bring that up is Back in the 70s, I had this old Hammerlin shortwave radio and on VOA, of course, was one of the stations I tuned in as I was listening around the world. Uh, tell us a story about you working for VOA. Voice of America is a very unique uh, operation. Some say it's our national propaganda radio station that's heard around the world. No, it is not propaganda. If you really want to know what's going on in the world, and I can tell you, having been in the military, and you as well, that uh, my last duty station was at the Embassy of Paris during the Vietnam Peace Talks, which was the funneling point for all information coming out of Southeast Asia. And what the government decided to release as you know, press releases, what the press services and wire services thought was worthy of dissemination, down to... Uh, what the radio stations would pull off the wire, and in particularly in the case of uh, a weekender, for example, who was a you were rip and read, you were playing rock and roll, and you put on <laughs> you put on a long song and ran over and pulled the news wire, and then you had to read the news yourself, and because you couldn't pronounce D and Ben Fu, it, it, you never read that story, and you know <clears throat> what what started out as a ended up at Z with a lot of everything missing in between, if it got aired at all. And that's assuming that there was no political prejudice or anything in it. Right. So you can say, I can truthfully say VOA never censored anything that I did. I was a stringer for the talk side, the shortwave, and I also had a program in the 80s, late 80s, when the Soviet Union collapsed. It was interesting. I was at one of the 
radio conferences in Cannes, France, and Voice of America had an FM radio station as well, which played rock and roll. I mean, it's America. Mm-hmm. you got to have rock and roll. And it was interesting to see they had set up a booth, and all of the Eastern Bloc stations that had been blocking Voice of America were there signing up to carry Voice of America. <laughs> all they did was turn the satellite receiver around and bingo, they were on the air. And I said, you yeah, know, what would you like for that program? And I, I came up with a show called Radio Remembers. And it was this day in history vignette, yeah, which would have something historical. And then, oh, yeah, it's Chuck Berry's birthday, and here's the only number one song he had, my thing like. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, and, yeah, and that went over very well for a number of years. But I also did broadcasts for them as a stringer uh, from... Well, for example, the Berlin Wall, the night it came down from Saudi Arabia when Bob Hardy and I were there doing a live broadcast. If you want to know what's really going on in the world, get a shortwave receiver and listen to Voice of America. Although by their charter, they're not, they don't align their antennas to broadcast to the United States so that it is not political. Uh, but Voice of America, the BBC, and Deutsche Welle, out of Germany, which also has English broadcast, mm-hmm. you'll, you'll find the true perspective of what's going on in the world. My wife was a big fan of listening to BBC radio, especially when COVID hit. They were broadcasting the truth while the states were so far behind. Yep. And Leslie said, this is coming our way. We've got to be prepared. And sure enough, it wasn't no more than two weeks later that we were shutting things down. It's amazing. You're absolutely right. Now, let's talk about a project that you and your wife, Sue, have been working on for quite some time, the Travel Planner Show. How did this originate, and where's it heard at now, Kevin? Because I want to put this down in the show notes. Sure. Uh, We started 23 years ago, shortly after we got married, and I was doing weekends at KTRS for Tim Dorsey, a talk show. Uh, I was at work at Brentwood, and the phone rang, and it was the new program director, and he says, can you come out? We need to talk. And I said, that's okay. Just send me my check. I'll come get my head. <laughs> the new broom always sweeps. Clean, Absolutely. You know? Ain't that the truth? My <laughs> <Yeah>. goodness. <laughs> we're, we're moving in a different direction, uh, is the quote. But he said, and we are, but I, there's something I want to talk to you about. There's a place for you if you want to do it. So I jumped in the car. We had lunch. He had come from Phoenix, where a guy had a travel talk show and started out as a 10-minute vignette or whatever fill-in show and ended up being four hours at a time. He said, I want a travel show. And to the person, everyone that I've spoken to at the station said, you have been everywhere, done everything. My ex-wife worked for PWA, so yeah, we did travel a lot. But even going back as a child, we had to do vacation every year. So I love to travel and still do. He said, if you want to do a travel show on the weekends, I got a place for you. I said, I'm assuming this will include some travel. He says, you won't believe. And I said, well, I've got to include my new wife. We've only been married a few months. And has she been in radio? No. What's her background? I said, she spent 20 plus years at Merit's Communications in their travel department. And she can out talk me. And he said, okay, done. (laughs) <laughs> and that weekend, we started the Travel Planners Radio Show. Wow. It's now, as I say, into our 23rd year. We're on 30 stations around the United States. And, I, you know, there's podcasts from our flagship station, WCGO, in Chicago, AM and FM. And, um, yeah, it's, it's been a very fun ride, if you will. We will put the list of stations down in the show notes. So if you happen to have a desire to you know, check out the Travel Planner Show. We'll give you a list of all the stations that are carrying it. Now, sure. Kevin, here's one thing I have a hard time understanding, and maybe you can shed a little light on this. I see a lot of, I guess you would say, uh, YouTube influencers or you know, the average podcaster who are, you know, next thing you, you see them on YouTube, and all of a sudden they're flying first class across the pond with all accommodations and such. Now, I know the average podcaster or YouTube influencer doesn't have that kind of bread. How is that happening? Who is paying for this? That's a good question. And I will tell you this, you're not seeing as many of the, quote, influencers as you used to. 
five, six years ago, uh, all of the convention and visitors bureaus, tourism agencies and everything, oh, you've got to have a podcast, you've got to be on, uh, you, you know, this, that, and the other, Twitter and all that, you're to be an influencer. And let's face it, a majority of the Twitter listeners or viewers, they're not affording travel as we know it. So they're they're kind of... I think most of the destinations and marketing people are realizing that that's not a big bang for their buck. But um, initially, sure, they were giving them the world. And that has changed, uh, particularly from, oh, probably 10 years ago when we got a little setback in the economy. All of a sudden, uh, the fam trips or familiarization trips pretty much disappeared. Do some people get free trips? Yes. Uh, most of them are not full tilt boogie. Uh, most of them now, if you can get there, you know, they'll provide you with a place to stay and something to eat and take you on a tour of all the things they want to see. And is it fun and work? Uh, yes, more work than fun because a lot of times, for example, a, a city or a state will uh, want to show you a week's worth of stuff in two and a half days. So you're out of the hotel at 7 in the morning, you don't get back till midnight, and you come home and listen to your interviews and look at your videos to see where you were. So, yeah, there are a few of them out there. Not many, yeah. if you will. I just uh, find it fascinating. It's like, well, yeah, I'm going first class here to uh, Auckland, New Zealand on the A380. This is my capsule that I'm in, and I'm going... Good Lord, how did you get that gig? Yeah. <laughs> or do well, you have a rich uncle or what? <laughs> Photoshop's a wonderful thing, Rick. <laughs> That's all I'll say, uh, okay? okay. My, now, Kevin, <laughs> and, my, you, and you can find anything on the Internet, so go nuts. <laughs> okay. My wife Leslie and I are heading to Great Britain next year. We have a special package over here in Valparaiso, Indiana, uh, that is actually doing a uh, kind of history of the Beatles type tour. And we'll be going to London and Liverpool. Can you tell us some great sites that are absolute musts in London and Liverpool? Liverpool, you're probably not going to be that excited about once you get there. It's a very industrial city, yes, for the tourists. There are some Beatle attractions and so on. But London is a marvelous town. Just incredible. Uh, there's an Indian restaurant off of Piccadilly Circus. It's been there for 150 years, if you like a good curry. Uh, realize that the U.K. and America are a common nations divided by a common language. Many things, the, the phrase that uh, a Brit might have for something uh, you might not understand, but you will be warmly welcomed, and Carnaby Street is still there. It's very kitsch. You can still buy any kind of miniskirt or whatever, you know, you want to be a young hippie in the back in the day. And it's just, you're going to love it. You absolutely love it. Right. Do not be concerned about everybody saying the food sucks because it doesn't. They've, they've got some marvelous restaurants in the U.K. now. That's well, very good. Now, speaking of London, I see in your notes that you attended the royal wedding. Can you elaborate on that one? Yeah, that was fun. Uh, I got a, a letter inviting me to Fergie's royal wedding. Uh, I, I, to this day, don't know who or why it was sent to me, uh, but uh, I said, you know, I got to go to this. And I had a friend that I had met. His uncle ran Garrett and Lofthouse Publishing, uh -huh. which means nothing to the average person other than they printed all of the Beatles albums covers and ran into him in a uh, rather inebriated state in a restaurant in Boston and we became immediate friends needless to say and I said you know they, he and his accountant were trying to decide whether they're going to fly back to England that night or stay another day and I said well you know I stood up and they were on the other side of the room I said until you bloody well decide why don't you come have a drink with the colonists that started the whole thing <laughs> they were going to come back to St. Louis then. And so I'm, we're going to the airport, and he says, stop the car. I think that's it. And the other one said, yep, it is. They, they found their rental car they lost. Oh, the day before. 
the last we saw of them was they were jumping a curb to get back into the rental car turn in, and we never saw them again until I got in touch with him. And as I would go back and forth to Europe, I'd always stop over for a, a couple of pints with Christopher. Wonderful. And so I called Christopher, and I said, you know, I'm coming to the Royal. Oh, great. We'll go. We'll set you up. And we ended up going to a guild house, which is like a big union hall. Mm-hmm. And we cut cakes with swords and everything else. And he had a Mercedes that we actually followed the royal procession down through London in his car doing a live broadcast on the cell phone. <laughs> it was incredible. <laughs> and, yes, there there was alcohol involved. But, yeah. uh Kevin, you got to write a book, man. You got to write. A book. Yeah, that's what everybody says. But you know, I'm a talker, not a writer. I, I can't spell. I can't type. Uh, maybe this new AI thing can get me. Yeah, through that. It, it's been a good ride, and there are a lot of other great stories. Kevin, that's why I'm doing the podcast. Uh, my my wife of just a couple of years uh, is not familiar of the years and years that I worked for the All Star Radio Network and all the interviews that I did. Oh yeah, and she said, you know, you have got to write a book. And I said, I can't write a book. She says, Well, how about a podcast? And I said, Well. Yeah, I can talk. So, yeah. so that's well, what the that... end result of that royal wedding was. I brought back, uh, and the program director at the time says, "No, you can't go." And I said, "Look, you know, I'm going." Uh, and I said, "I'll bring back all kinds of kitschy stuff to give away." So I brought back a suitcase full of teacups and saucers and bumper stickers and everything that we gave away for a month on the air from the royal wedding. So Very cool. Some of the listeners probably still have some. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Now, before we continue, I want to thank everybody for listening in to this episode of the Someone You Should Know podcast. Hey, we're on the web at someoneyoushouldknowpodcast.com. There you'll find the recent news, our archive of past episodes, and a whole lot more. By the way, if you happen to be on, do us a favor and leave us a review. Let us know how we're doing. And like Casey Case would say, we're very blessed to be heard coast to coast and around the world. Our podcast reaches all over the place. And I want to thank the cities of uh, uh, Montgomery, Alabama, Oxnard, California, and Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Thanks so much as we get back to our interview with my old friend, Kevin McCarthy. Speaking of Saudi Arabia, Kevin, you talked about this a little earlier. You were in Saudi Arabia just before Desert Storm went hot. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, it was uh, in conjunction with the U.S. Air Force, KMOX, and Bob Hardy, the morning man. Bob was retired Air Force, and he played golf with the general over at Scott Air Force Base at least once a week. Uh, They said, would you like to go do a broadcast? Sure. So I took care of getting our passports and visas and all that kind of stuff put together, along with Paul Grundhauser, our engineer, and... We actually flew up to the East Coast to catch a C-5, which is, oh, you talk about, well, you call it heavy aluminum overcast. What an amazing <laughs> airplane. And, the, and Were you back it, in the tail part, or did they have troop seats? No, no. Uh, it was uh, all car- cargo. In fact, the last thing they put on the plane was a nose landing gear assembly. And I said, oh, have you got a wounded bird over there? And they said, no, it's for this plane, but we don't have time to fix it here. And I'm going, oh, that's a bird, Gene. <laughs> 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 but uh, the pilot just so happened to be Bob Hardy's son-in-law, Mr. Oh, Glenn goodness. Chin, yeah. who actually uh, uh, spent a great deal of time with Southwest Airlines yeah. after he retired. But we had full run of the airplane. I mean, we, we Bob got Bob is a pilot or was a pilot himself, so he got to sit in the right seat for a while and uh, do a bank or two. And uh, I had video and everything from that. We were in Dahran Air Base, and we landed, and we didn't even clear the customs. They gave us the royal treatment. We were wow. out in the field. Uh, our PAO or political affairs officer was Mark Rosenker, who later became the head of NHTSA and so on. He was a reservist out of Washington, D.C., but assigned through Scott Air Force Base. And he said, okay, that big thing that looks like a bunch of mail and a milk crates stacked on one another over on the other side of the air base, uh, you didn't see that, but you'll find out what it is in a, soon. And that was the Patriot Missile System the first time wow. it had been de- deployed. I was standing between the parallel runways taking video of uh, English hurricanes and uh, 
Phantom Jets and everything else taking off. We were out in the desert then the next morning, and this guy came up to me and says, Oh, it's Kevin McCarthy. I won $1,000 from you two weeks ago on KHTR. <laughs> 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 which, which Bob Hardy just, you know, oh, okay, he's the star, I guess. And uh, he said, yeah, Mom said you were coming over. We did a live broadcast from, uh, and if you remember watching any of the coverage from yeah. Saudi Arabia, you always saw those two kind of pastel blue domes in the background. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody thought those were radar domes. Uh, they were actually the awnings over the changing cabanas of the hotel <laughs> swimming pool. And the palm tree you saw was a plastic palm tree. The, the, the JIB, or Joint Information Bureau, the uplink uh, services, yeah. were on pallets on top of the roof of the kitchen of the uh, hotel that we were staying in in Dahran. There was a 12-man tent filled with all the uplink stuff. We did a live broadcast from there. It was approximately midnight, so that we were doing the morning show on KMOX. Right. And as we're getting set up, the local guy says, you want the palm tree? I'm going, no, it's radio, don't worry. Yeah, you want palm tree? Yeah, yeah, fine. <laughs> Put the palm tree right there. That's perfect. We, have, we also have inflatable camel. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the second phone call that we got was from a fellow from U-City. I don't recall his name, but... Uh, let's call him Hiram, okay. and Mark Rosenker obviously was not Irish, okay? Uh, but we were, took, he says, yeah, he says, Bob, you got a, a Mark Rosenker that you there. That's my nephew. <laughs> and, and he goes, I do have an uncle in St. Louis. That's right, Mark. I said, I got one question for you. Are you still going to Temple? <laughs> the first time I ever saw a colonel in political public affairs without the ability to say anything. <laughs> the, the, the guys in the uplink tent are rolling on the floor laughing. Oh, and he said, did anybody hear that? Did anybody hear that? No, they didn't. You know. <laughs> so we got back, and a couple months later, he uh, made full bird colonel, and they had his pinning party over at Scott, and we went over there and played that as part of the ceremony, which just brought the house down. But Fascinating. Mark, Mark was a wonderful guy and went on to a very successful governmental Gosh. career outside of the Air Force. Yeah. Now, another fascinating note you talked about a little earlier I want to touch on also. You were there also when the Berlin Wall came down. You're, yes. you're becoming radio's version of Forrest Gump with all these historic events. Can you tell us about that? I have thought that, and people have said that. Yeah, uh, many years, I spent about five or six years doing... Uh, international radio conferences at uh, the MEDEM conference, which is an acronym in French for music and media. And that's in Cannes, France, uh, each year. It's the same group as the film festival, only it's about music, media, and so on, and the Montreux Rock Festival. And made a good friend who was in AFN Air Force, by the way, Rick Delisle, and he was stationed in Berlin and still lives there after he retired. And he called me up on a Friday afternoon and said, Kevin, you got to get over here. The Berlin Wall's coming down this weekend. I said, Rick, I don't know what you're smoking, but it must be good. Send me some. <laughs> <laughs> Jokingly, of course. Uh, that is one thing. I've been known to have a few cocktails, but I've never done any drugs. But... He said, no, it's it's either coming down or it's World War Three, but you need to be here. <laughs> Knowing that my ex worked for TWA, I said, all right, I'll see what I can do. And I was just sitting down to do the afternoon shift at KHDR, hit radio. I called Highland's office and said, sir, the Berlin Wall's coming down this weekend. How accurate are your sources? I said, at least 75%. He said, we'll go. So he said, I said, well, he said, we'll get somebody to do your shift. Get out of here. Go. <laughs> it's a wall coming down weekend here. <laughs> yeah. So okay, I ran, to the, I, I ran to the, to the uh, radio or to the airport, got on a plane and uh, was on the same plane as Dan Rather and all of them coming into Berlin, uh, which, by the way, his crew was not there, his camera crew, and he was not a happy camper. 
but uh, got there on Saturday morning, took a taxi down to the Brandenburg Gate. They had a portable stage set up, and Rather was up there along with all the other network anchors. And all I, I mean, I literally left the radio station and went. I had a, a small suitcase, and I was still carrying it around. And I'm standing now at the foot of this stage, and the only ID I have is my KMOX door card, <laughs> the security card. And I remember somebody saying that he and Dan were, uh, that Highland and Dan, rather, were very close friends. I saw Dan, and I said, Dan, Bob Highland sent me. He grabbed my hand and pulled me up on the stage. Wow. Nice to have friends in uh, in high places. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I ended up standing next to Billy Bront while he's giving his speech. And, uh, you know, it was a, it was the Fourth of July, New Year's, you name it, uh, your birthday, anything and everything for a celebration. Wow! And at midnight that night, we could hear diesel engines starting on the other side of the wall, and we didn't know whether it was tanks or bulldozers or what and as it was it was cranes and bulldozers and they started tearing down the wall amazing amazing yeah uh it was they streamed across the border rick and at checkpoint charlie there was scaffolding there where they were working on some buildings on the western side and people were hanging off of that giving the, the east germans as they came through bottles of beer and wine and throwing money at them and because of the law at that time in what was West Germany, anybody that made it out of East Germany got what was called Wandergeld or walking money. Mm -hmm. It was like 40 or 50 bucks. So they all started lining up at the banks. It was cold. I mean, it was very cold that night. And we tried to, we're on the air, Rick's on the air telling them to, uh, they were going to give out like line tickets so that they could, Stay in line like at a concert. Well, they had no idea what that concept was, but we tried to get everyone to go down into the subways to stay warm. Uh, they weren't hearing it, so we broadcast, you know, if you've got a spare sweater or, you know, some hot coffee or hot coffee, people started streaming out of apartments with Amazing. blankets. And, uh, it was. And, uh, it, it, of course, it became, after a great party, a great hangover because... Or like my West German father-in-law at the time, their taxes, in some cases, tripled because they had to rebuild the entire infrastructure of East Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, the East Germans came across and would work cheaper than what the union organized labor in West Germany was. And, of course, their idea of work was you go to work, have a cup of coffee, take a break, wait for supplies, go to lunch, come back have some more coffee, smoke a cigarette, wait for supplies. They, they, at that point, they had no real work ethic, yeah. so mm -hmm. the productivity fell. It, the few years after that was quite tough for the West Germans. Oh, wow. Well. Got to change gears a little bit, Kevin, with uh, summer, you know, kind of winding down as we get ready to early fall. If, uh, if you and Sue would give some recommendations regarding travel destinations that we should consider, both stateside and overseas right now. Well, if you have not been to Israel, go. We've been there twice. It is the most amazing country in the world. Just incredible. It makes your head spin. Everything, whether you're Christian, Jew, atheist, whatever, any story of the human experience and evolution is right there. You can see it. You can touch it. Uh, it's just an amazing destination. Uh, is it safe? Yes, it's safe. I mean, and I, I guess I should paraphrase that saying I live in St. Louis, but that's not fair. <laughs> uh, that's true. <laughs> it's just, you know, so be it. Uh, okay, some people get unnerved when you're sitting at the McDonald's and the truckload of uh, uh, Israeli troops, young boys and girls, come in with their uh, weapons and so on, but how, how much safer could you be? Yeah. You know, and we have driven through the West Bank. There's no demarcation line, no things you have to check off, you know, it's just, it's an amazing country from the Ramon Crater, which is not a, a crater as we call it, it's a valley and it's like the uh, Grand Canyon, only I think a little deeper. 
you could actually go down to the bottom and walk on the mantle of the earth up through the Dead Sea into the northern highlands where you can go snow skiing, and you can do that all in one day. Jeez, yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's kind of like California, where you can go from uh, the beach on one side to the mountains on yes, the other side, yeah. <laughs> precisely. Uh, one place I would say domestically is, well, of course, you've got Branson. There's something there for everybody. But hidden in the hills of southern Indiana, uh, not far from you, I guess, is... Uh, a place where back in the day, uh, the 1900s, all of the Major League Baseball teams did their spring training there. It's the home of Larry Bird. And French Lick? They're French Lick, Indiana. Yeah. What an amazing place. Wow. Just amazing. And prior to the Astrodome being built, the New Baden Hotel there and Resort was the largest domed building in the world. Jeez, oh, I did not know that. I'm going to have to check that out. That's about five hours south of us, but yeah, that's you will cool. You will be absolutely amazed. And at, it started out, uh, they had hot sulfur springs, and it was built just before the Depression. When the Depression hit, they, of course, failed, and they sold the property to the Catholic Church, who immediately blocked off the springs because God heals people, not hot water. <laughs> and... <laughs> Then it was, they ran a school there. It was part of a junior college, and it set abandoned for years. Mm -hmm. There's a, a huge mosaic tile floor in the dome area. There is a majolica ceramic fireplace that is 40 feet wide and probably 15 or 20 feet tall. Uh, we talked to a security guard there. He said as a teenager, they rode their four-wheelers inside. There were trees growing up Jeez. in there. Amazing. The fellow... The fellow that invented the artificial heart lives in Indiana. The heart valves and so on. Mm -hmm. Spent hundreds of millions of dollars renovating this place. And it is, it by far blows away any castle or anything I've ever seen in Europe. All right. Going to have to check that out. How about some social links for the Travel Planners show, Kevin? We're going to go ahead and include all the stations down in the show notes, but we also want to include some of the links where people can find out more about the uh, Travel Planners show. Sure. Uh, our basic big one is, of course, our YouTube channel. Uh, it's youtube.com forward slash Kevin and Sue Travel. All right. Very simple. And it's A-N-D, not an ampersand. All one word, Kevin and Sue Travel. There are hundreds of videos from all over the world. It now has more than, the channel has more than 988,000 views. Uh, and we're always posting new ones as well. And the podcasts are available through WCGORadio.com in Chicago. You drill through the shows, down to Travel Planners, listen live, which you can do on Saturday mornings, and uh, then you will see each individual segment that has been saved as an individual podcast. They're about nine minutes long. That's one. Very good. Very good. Now, Kevin... I'm going to back up here and go back to radio for one more second here because there's a segment we always include, especially when we have musicians on, and it's called Tales from the Road. Those are those infamous road stories of things that happened or the things that didn't go quite as planned. Now, if I were to have Boz Skaggs on, he might tell me the tale about the time that someone by the name of Kevin McCarthy swiped his limo. Can you tell us that story? <laughs> it's true. I stole Boss Skaggs' limo, unknown at the time. This was at the Montreux Rock Festival, okay. uh, again, where I was a speaker for a number of years, uh, because they have a, a, a media branch that you know is a convention as well as the Rock Festival. It's done by the European equivalent of uh, Billboard magazine. And Boss was on tour in Europe. I was working for CBS. He was on the CBS label. I had done the morning show, flew all night, got to Montreux, went to the conference, and went over to the CBS booth where I had the misfortune of meeting this uh, female. I will not call her a lady. Uh -oh. And uh, I said, you know, sometime during the next five days, can I get an interview with Boss? We're uh, CBS O&O, KHTR, hit radio 103. And she's, we're not doing U.S. interviews. <laughs> and I went, okay, uh, I understand you're not on tour there yet. I'd be more than glad to hold it in the can. But, you know, <clears throat> we're CBS owned and operated. You're the CBS label. Can I get an interview? 
no. <laughs> and I looked at her and I said, you know, I've been up for probably 36 to 40 hours, and I don't know who pissed in your Cheerios this morning, but it wasn't me. And between here and New York, or St. Louis is New York, and I'm going to stop at Black Rock and do my best to get you fired. Mm-hmm. I don't care. You're not getting an interview. Oh, okay. <laughs> Went back to the hotel and just threw across the bed and crashed. Had my CBS T-shirt on and a pair of jeans. About 6.30, 7 o'clock at night, I get a phone call, and it said, you're with CBS? I said, yeah, your limo's here. <laughs> and I said, my what? Your limo's here. They're waiting for you downstairs. I thought, oh, maybe she had a change of heart. So I went downstairs. Here's the limo driver. It's the only stretch limo in Montreux, Switzerland. And they said, you're with CBS? I said, looked at my shirt said, yep, that's what it says. Oh, come on, we got to go. And I thought, well, maybe Boz is in the limo. I can get a, you know, on the ride over there. And we pulled up to the venue, to the artist backstage entrance. There's TV cameras at part of Eurovision Music Festival, et cetera. There's thousands of kids and so on outside the fenced-off area. I don't have a ticket. I don't have a laminate. I don't have diddly squat to get into this building. So I waited. I'm standing out, and there was a lady who worked at a station in New York, and uh, she had that typical Bronx voice, okay? And as I get out of the limo, I hear this, Oh, my God, it's McCarthy. (laughs) <laughs> I'm waving I'm waving at everybody, you know, and they're all flashbulbs are going on. I'm going, this is pretty cool, but I'm going to die right here. And I waited till the next group pulled up, which was right behind us, and just walked in with them, walked into the backstage bar, which is where the stage entrance was, and I see a young fellow from the Netherlands. He was uh, one of the, in fact, I introduced him. Uh, to the folks at MTV, and he got a job as one of their DJs. And for the life of me, I can't think of his uh, name at the moment, but a long blonde hair, good looking kid, about six foot six. He's sitting there doing interviews, and he goes, Hey, Kevin, how you doing? Come on over, buddy. What's going on? And I said, oh, I'm trying to get some interviews. He said, Get a beer, pull up a stool, sit right here. When I'm done with them, they're yours. I ended up getting every interview that I wanted. In except, one except evening. Boss. <laughs> well, except Boz, you know. But you got well, his limo. <laughs> well, the, the whole story goes on with uh, uh, Boz was supposed to close out the first act or the first half of the show, and then there was going to be an intermission. And this gal is running all over back. Has anybody seen Boz? Has anybody seen Boz? Has anybody seen his limo? Where the hell is he? Blah, 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 blah. And I'm just kind of thinking to myself, I wonder. Did I get his limo? (laughs) So they did the intermission. Boz still isn't there. I'm getting all the interviews. And she came over and asked the guy from MTV, have you seen? No, I haven't seen him. And by that time, I had figured it out. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, I apologize. I, I know I was very rude to you this afternoon at the conference. And, you know, I'm really, you know, want to apologize. I said, but you didn't have to send the limo for me. <laughs> hey, was that Adam was that Adam Curry you were talking to? Yes. Yeah, yes, yeah. it was. Adam Curry. He nice won't, guy. He wound up becoming the the, the pod father, the uh, the godfather oh, yeah. of yeah. podcasting. Yeah. 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 He was working at a station uh in the Netherlands and uh I well it was uh, Radio Veronica. I'll be darned. And uh, I introduced him to the folks from MTV, and the next thing you know, he got the job. Yeah, he's a good-looking guy. Yeah, yeah, and a very nice guy as well, I will add. So, uh, yeah, watching her head explode was one of the higher points of my life. (laughs) Very very (laughs) good. The night I stole, and of course, you know, like any conference, all of the business and fun is done at the hotel bar after the event, you know, at night. And, uh, you know, I spent the whole night telling the story to everybody Jeez. in the that, lobby bar. <laughs> that, that that should be the title of your book, I Stole Boz Skaz Glimmo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I hey. toured a lot with Bon Jovi, too. Oh, did you really? Yeah, they 
In fact, when I was at uh, KHTR, we were do we wanted to do a benefit concert. There was a young girl that needed a liver transplant, and from a, a very poor family, we didn't want to do a show or an event for just one individual. So uh, I got Shriners Hospital for Crippled Children involved uh, as part of the benefit, and uh, one of the, I was trying to find. We we're gonna. We didn't want to do a battle of bands because we had the candy band playing at, at all of our uh, county parks summer events every week. And if they didn't win, why then our whole summer promotion was dead. So we, uh, I tried to find. I had them as an opening act, and I tried to find a national act that was either on the way up or on the way down. And the record guy who was quitting that label the day I talked to him a Friday said. Here's Bon Jovi's manager's name. Don't tell him I gave you his phone number. They might just do it, and they did. They came in and played for free. Jeez, I love, I love, uh, I love moments like that. And uh, and yeah. John, I've talked to John once. Very, very accommodating individual. We had a very brief time to talk, but very accommodating individual. And uh, he and Boz, he and uh, Eddie Money are probably the two nicest guys in rock and roll. Yeah. Yep, I, I got it. I got to admit, uh, I'd never talked to Eddie, but, I, but as far as John, yeah, I, I have to agree. He's a very, very accommodating guy, and he's you know he's just a, a good soul, and that's just uh, yeah. And I every I know, time I, I know that from the time that he took all his money and wound up uh, opening at that uh, that that restaurant that or that uh, yeah that, that, still that, has that it. food bank, you know, whatever yep. it is. Yeah. yeah, every time they would come back into to the Midwest and to St. Louis in particular, they would sign autographed guitars and stuff. We actually sold dates with the whole band for a fundraiser wow. for charity nice. uh, at the Adams Mark Hotel. You know, you got limo to the event. With it was Boz Skaggs band. limo, too, by the way. <laughs> yeah, what? Well, <laughs> could have been. Could have been. I, I'll never tell. But uh, uh, just anything that, that for charity, John and the band would do it. Awesome. Just super. Very good, very good. Final thoughts on travel, Kevin. Uh, I have to ask you this question. What essentials do you and Sue never leave home without? And don't say your American Express traveler, traveler's checks. <laughs> no, traveler's checks aren't really accepted much anymore. Yeah, it, It's all credit cards. And I would tell you, with your credit cards, before you leave, check with... Uh, Call your credit card issuer and tell them that you will be out of the country because if they start seeing a, charges coming from Germany or France or something, they're very likely to shut your card down. Right, yeah, exactly. Thinking exactly. that it's, uh, you know, and they'll tell you after you call them, oh, you didn't really need to call us. Well, yeah, you really do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say also sunscreen. Okay. <laughs> I don't care where you're going, sunscreen is big. We have to have our computers. It's much easier now with cell phones. Mm -hmm. You can you can buy a SIM chip anywhere you go that puts you into a local number. We have a thing called mobile M O B A L phone, and for I think it's fifty seventy five bucks, they send you a cell phone that's good around the world, and cool. they only they only charge you when you use it, and it's a separate number so that you're not rag you know, ranking up huge dollar amounts on your international calls on your cell phone. Mm, exactly, so, exactly. Although now, for example, we're with AT and T. I have no problem with tell, telling you that. And I can call them, and you can buy two weeks of international time for like fifteen bucks a week. Or Very something. good. It, Very good. It's cheap. Yeah. All right, Kev. It's an absolute treat to get in touch with you. It's been so many years, and. Uh, I wish you the very, very best. And once again, folks, all the information's down in the show notes, and we'll uh, make sure that you check that out. It's been a treat. I thank you so very much for taking the time to be with me today, man. Always a pleasure. And the next time we'll tell you about planting a tree from George Washington's revolutionary headquarters on the Russian White House lawn. By the way, if you go to our YouTube site, you're going to have to dig down deep and go deep into the video but there is a video of the U.S. Air Force band marching into Red Square that I did playing the Stars and Stripes Forever March. Cool. It still very, sends a chill down in my back. Very cool. Very cool. Absolute treat, brother. Thanks again for being on the show. Always a pleasure. Let's get together. Absolutely, buddy. God bless you, Kev.
Hi, this is Rick Anthony thanking you again for listening to this episode of Someone You Should Know. Now, if you're an aspiring musician or an established musician that's looking for a little exposure, I invite you to drop us a line at someone you should know podcast at gmail.com. That's someone you should know podcast at gmail.com. Also, I invite you to tell a friend about the Someone You Should Know podcast. I thank you for tuning in this time and I invite you to check us out next time on the Someone You Should Know podcast, because you never know who's going to show up. Until next time, remember, God loves you, and so do I.